Welcome everyone. My name is Adam Savitt. I'm Director of Communications at the Center for Security Policy. Welcome to the latest event in our webinar series. Today's program is entitled Strategic Minerals, Breaking the Chinese Supply Chain to Restore American Sovereignty. Featuring Daniel McGordy, Pete Rosell, Rabbi Yefeskel Moskowitz, and moderated by our own Dr. J. Michael Waller. Before we begin, just a couple housekeeping items. First of all, you are in listen-only mode, but you are able to ask questions. Look at your GoToWebinar control panel, and under questions, you can type a que uh, text question, and I will bring those to the panel at the end of the program. We also be, will be recording this event. It will be archived on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash securefreedom, and on our website, securefreedom.org. With that, I'll hand it over to our Senior Analyst for Strategy at the Center for Security Policy, Dr. J. Michael Waller. Well, the, the Chinese are controlling the strategic minerals that keep our country and our economy and our defenses going. Right now, we lack a national strategy for what to do with it, and so we're still almost completely dependent on China for some key things for keeping America first. So we're going to discuss this today in our panel with uh, three three guests. We've got Pete Rosell of Penn State University at their Center for Critical Minerals. He's a former uh, headquarters program manager for rare earths. Uh, minerals at the Department of Energy, and then we'll go to Dan McGrory, who's a principal at the Karmat Group and an uh, adjunct professor at George Washington University, and uh, he's also a consulting columnist for Real Clear World. And then finally, we'll have Rabbi Yeheskel Moskowitz, who's, in addition to being a rabbi and a, a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy, he's also in the business. He's CEO of Materia. USA, which is a critical minerals extraction startup company that uh, extracts uh, critical minerals from basically recycled electronic waste and other exotic means. So with it, uh, we'll go right to Pete. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to just run through a little bit of what's required with respect to rare earth production in the U.S. Uh, rare earths probably get the most headlines of anything uh, in the critical mineral space. First question is, what is a rare earth ore? Uh, rare earths in the, in the earth's crust typically run about 240 parts per million, which is uh, uh, crustal average. It is much less than what you need for an ore. Uh, rare earth ores themselves can run as high as 10% rare earths. But to get from rare earth ore to rare earth metals and ultimately to magnets, there's a number of things that have to happen. First, the rare earths have to be separated from the non-rare earths in the minerals uh, or in the rock. Uh, second thing that has to happen is the rare earths have to be chemically extracted from the rock. And the third thing is that the rare earths have to be uh, separated from each other. Those parts of the value chain are all required to produce rare earths from a deposit. Uh, all of those parts of the value chain are not currently in the U.S. Some are, some are not. The first step, uh, once the ore is mined, is it's physically concentrated, which uh, takes it from whatever it was in the ground, maybe 7% uh, uh, rare earths up to uh, maybe over 50%. Second step, uh, the rare earths have to be chemically extracted, as I said. Uh, that can include uh, reactions with acids or uh, uh, chemicals like uh, sodium hydroxide can also include what's called acid baking or acid roasting where it's heated to a high temperature and uh, then uh, reacted in the rock and then when it's cooled the, the rare earths can be leached out of the rock. Once you've gotten to the leach solution the impurities have to be removed from the solution and then uh, the rare earths are fed into the last step which separates the rare earths into the individual compounds. The most expensive step in this entire chain is the chemical extraction of the rare earths from the rock. That can run as high as $100 to $150 per ton of feed, and uh, that, that particular step in the value chain is largely absent in the U.S. right now. Uh, once it's uh, been uh, leached again, impurities have to be removed. Sometimes those impurities can have low levels of uh, naturally occurring radionuclides in them. That has to be dealt with in the entire process, and again, that can uh, that that can make it a little bit difficult to uh, restore that part of the value chain back back in the U.S. And then the last step is the separation of the individual rare earths into uh, 
their individual compounds. The feed to that process is going to be a mixture of uh, rare earths that are present in a solution or in a, in a uh, dried filter cake. And uh, in a perfect world, you would separate each one of the rare earths into a different uh, stream from the process. That uh, step in the process is largely absent in the U.S., although it's returning in a, on a smaller scale. The last plant that did that at a large scale closed in Texas in 1998, and uh, the company's uh, capabilities to do that were moved to Inner Mongolia and China. A couple of highlights on the history of rare earths, particularly uh, with respect to federal government participation. Uh, originally, rare earths were produced as a byproduct of thorium. Thorium was used to make gas lamp mantles. In the U.S., the company that did that uh, originally was the Velsbach Incandescent Light Company in New Jersey. Uh, they started experimenting with recovering rare earths from their process and found that then they had to start developing markets. Other companies, uh, Lindsay Light and Chemical in uh, Chicago, Michigan Chemical in Michigan, and uh, <clears throat> uh, Pitco in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee started uh, processing these ores as well and were producing rare earths. Following World War II, uh, the Atomic Energy Act was passed, I believe, in 1946. And uh, one way that that helped the rare earth industry in the U.S. was that thorium that was produced as a byproduct of that industry at the time, rather than being a disposal liability, uh, became a revenue stream because the Atomic Energy Commission was conducting a fair amount of research on thorium and they were buying the thorium that was being produced by these rare earth producers. That thorium uh, purchased by the federal government started to wind down in the late 1950s and some of the companies that were involved in this, such as Baywood Chemical, uh, stopped producing rare earths because they, they that they were, lose, they were losing the revenue stream from the thorium. <laughs> Federal government also, in uh, as a result of the Atomic Energy Act, uh, put together an organization called the Defense Minerals Administration that was directed by uh, the, the individual that was also the director of the U.S. Bureau of Mines. They had an exploration program where they could fund, they, they could cost share up to 75% of the cost of, of geologic exploration in the U.S. where uh, radioactive uh, minerals were targets, particularly uranium or thorium. But there were several uh, side results that may not have been the intended purpose of the program. One of them was the discovery of a rare earth ore deposit up in Idaho, which ended up becoming the feedstock for the Michigan chemical plant. Another that's uh, probably more famous is the U.S. Bureau of Mines ran the first assays on the discovery at Mountain Pass in California in the late 1940s. Uh, U.S. Geological Survey mapped out the deposit, and then following that, the Molybdenum Corporation of America got the rights to the deposit and started producing on a fairly large scale. Going up to uh, the late 1960s, Molly Corp, which was the Molybdenum Corporation of America, had had essentially produced such a large volume of material that it started crowding the other American producers out of the market. But I think the point there is that uh, where the federal government was involved was on the discovery of the ores and uh, providing a, a cost share for the rare earth producers at the time by buying their thorium. Also, federal government, primarily through the U.S. Bureau of Mines, had a very heavy involvement in developing process technology for beneficiating the rare earths, that's the mineral concentration step. For extracting uh, the rare earths out of the rock, that's the chemical extraction step. And uh, the Atomic Energy Commission through the what's now the Ames National Lab and the U.S. Bureau of Mines both did a substantial amount of work on uh, separating the rare earth compounds, developing technologies that ended up being used by the industry to separate the rare earths into the individual compounds developing technologies as well that uh, turn those rare earth uh, compounds into the metals and alloys that are used, for example, in magnets today. There's been a lot of work uh, in the federal government recently over the last 10 years on this, but uh, a lot of it's been, again, on technology development. But one interesting item 
that uh, we don't see a lot about in Washington is the Critical and Strategic, or Strategic and Critical Mineral Stockpiling Act, as uh, amended by uh, the fiscal year 2017 NDAA conference report. And that is that uh, one of the passages in that is the president shall make scientific, technologic, and economic investigations concerning the development, mining, preparation, treatment, utilization of ores and other substances that are essential to the national defense. And uh, another part of that, that uh, report says that the that determination and development of new domestic sources and supply of such ores and mineral substances and uh, the development of new methods for the treatment and utilization of lower grade reserves. The lower grade reserves uh, part of this is very important because as the higher grade reserves are, are uh, exhausted, uh, lower grade reserves are going to have to start replacing those. We have some higher grade reserves in the U.S. Uh, there are high grade reserves in other places in the world as well. But I think the real uh, opportunity here is to start working on how to make these lower grade reserves pay. Some of these lower grade reserves are uh, considered unconventional resources or secondary sources. Uh, you've probably seen uh, the Department of Energy has been looking in uh, coal deposits for uh, rare earth opportunities. And uh, that qualifies as one of the lower grade reserves. There's a fair amount of uh, byproducts of the Florida phosphate industry that have been explored as potential sources of rare earths as well, and that's an opportunity. And uh, there's some metal mine tailings, in, primarily in the West, but not exclusively in the West, that uh, also make uh, contain significant amounts of rare earths as well as other critical minerals that are just sitting on the ground right now, and uh, they may represent low-cost uh, secondary sources as well. So uh, anyway, that's my uh, that that's my uh, opening statement, as it were. Great, thanks, Pete. That's a, we got a great engineering point of view there, uh, Dan. What does this all mean for the average American citizen? <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Waller. I appreciate it. And it's uh, great to be uh, beyond uh, with uh, with your group and uh, particularly following Pete, um, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for a number of years. And he has a very, you can tell, uh, you can see from his presentation or hear from his presentation uh, that he has a, a wealth of historic knowledge on this. He knows how we, uh, at one point, we, the United States, did this right. And he, therefore, has a very strong sense of how we got it wrong and how we have to get back on the correct path again. And um, Zeke, uh, being on today has a very very nice piece uh, posted through your um, uh, through your think tank, uh, which I would commend to everybody um, on the on the um, um, on the uh, program today. Everybody who's participating or watching or listening in, uh, because there are a number of nice points there uh, that uh, Zeke makes makes that uh, we should all uh, uh, pay pay heed to. Um, I want to frame my approach to this, and I spent in in government. I was in. Uh, uh, at the White House, but prior to that at the Pentagon, I had two presidential appointments at the Pentagon. And I want to um, frame uh, my take on this as uh, the tech wars. Sometimes I've called it the resource wars. Um, we know um, in, in our parlance that the U.S. and China are involved in a protracted trade war. And last year, in part of that trade war, um, there, was a there was a time in May, um, it's over a year now, when um, in the tariff counter tariff mode of the trade war, there was a uh, a picture, not even any um, statement, but a picture issued by the Chinese media of President Xi walking through a rare earth facility in China and walking with him was the lead trade negotiator for the Chinese. And the message was, you know, picture being worth a thousand words, uh, definitely, be, definitely the case in this instance that the Chinese uh, in the trade war, you don't have to do tariff, counter tariff, tit for tat. Uh, you can also uh, choose um, asymmetric responses. And that could be uh, involved the rare earths. People asked at that time, what does that mean? Uh, and then it led very quickly to a conversation about how deeply dependent the United States is on rare earths, what they're used for. Um, and the fact that China um, is the world's leading provider, could they be withheld um, from, from the U.S. as a retaliatory step? Uh, the trade wars 
ebb and flow. Uh, you can have a ceasefire in the trade wars. They can run hot. They can run cold. But what I was focused on and what remain focused on is underneath that, that is a sign of what I think is the tech war. And the tech war is going to happen for the duration of the 21st century. Um, I hope it rings true with the folks who are here, but many people wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Uh, China has been waging the tech war for some period of time. Certainly, they have been waging it uh, during the duration of the Ch Made in China 2025 approach uh, that uh, folks here may be uh, aware of. Um, the Made in China 2025 um, uh, mission statement, as it were, was rolled out in 2015. So we're now halfway through uh, that 10 year period and uh, barely on the United States side, taking cognizance of the fact that China um, was very serious about um, a series of steps to um, augment its technological capability uh, for both civilian um, communication and defense uses uses whether the United States was doing so or not. Part of China Made in China 2025 is a section which I commend to all of you called New Materials. And uh, New Materials would be the rare earths and, and, and what we also uh, these days call critical minerals, although it could be critical, critical metal, metals just as easily. Um, another sign that the Chinese are serious about this would be the One Belt, One Road uh, approach. Um, <clears throat> largely focused on as the Chinese building out infrastructure but if you look at some of the deals being made by the Chinese in One Belt, One Road and financing it uh, by extending um, credit to the countries through which One Belt, One Road would run, the Chinese will say in, um, if there is a default, uh, you can pay it off the One Belt, One Road investment um, by um, uh, cease yielding over infrastructure, but also resources to the Chinese. So in some respects, look at what the um, collateral is, I guess you could say. In One Belt, Run Road, you will find in, in, in significant interest to its, its instances, it is often a resource in scarce supply. Um, so three points today, uh, as I frame this, I wanna talk about in, if this is a tech war, um, get a snapshot of how serious it is. Uh, I would say the problem is wide and deep, and I'll go into that in a minute. I want to talk about the nature. Number two would be the nature of the conflict. And number three is, uh, in the simplest terms, the strategy. How do we win this war? How do we win it? Uh, what will it take? I've um, been reading Eric Larson's book on Churchill. So roles and responsibilities in terms of what's expected of each one of us to prevail in any conflict. What does that mean for us um, today? Um, so the problem is wide and deep. I would start by looking at the Department of Interior in 2018 took a, a very important step. Um, over decades, the United States government had um, a series of different lists of what materials, metals, and minerals are critical and or strategic. And the lists had different methodologies. And the DOE list said, we won't talk about uh, defense. And the defense list said, we won't talk about uh, commercial uses. Um, lists were pretty useless. 2018 Department of Interior took a look with the Department of Defense and came up with a single list. You can quibble about it, what's on it, what's not, but for the first time it was more of a holistic view of what might be critical and strategic to us. They came up with 35 critical minerals and metals, 35. They counted the rare earths as two. The rare earths as a group, the lanthanides, counted as one, and then scandium, which is not a lanthanide, but is typically classified as a rare earth, they counted as a rare earth also. So on that list of 35, this is important, two of the 35 are the rare earths as a group. That leaves 33 non-rare earths as critical. Out of that group of 35, 22 of the 35, the following can be said. China is either the number one producer in the world, or the number one provider to the US, or both, 22 of the 35. So, the, and that's what the rare is counting as two. So there are many, many metals and minerals that we're talking about um, in, this, in this category. I could, you know, in the Q and A, if you wanna know more about it, uh, gallium, graphite, uh, manganese, um, all of the different things that are used, that are that, that applications that those go into civilian, uh, commercial communications, um, defense, right? Um, so, and in, in, in it's, it's wide, therefore, deep also. In 14 of the 35, the United States is 100% in 
import dependent, 100% import dependent, right? So you are, we, we have um, a, a very deep uh, dependency. You think about how we struggled when we were dependent for the import of foreign oil, 40%, 50%, 60%. Um, and what that did through um, the latter part of the 20th century. Fortunately, we've turned that around. Well, we have a tech war going on where we're dependent on these metals and minerals every bit as much as we were dependent on foreign sourced oil at a single point in time. And that tech war is gonna define who prevails uh, and dominates in the 21st century. The Chinese are in the war. We're barely recognizing that there is a war. Um, that's where we are. That's at the, the front end of it. Uh, the nature of the conflict. Uh, I know I'm borrowing defense terms here. I'm doing it intentionally. It's an asymmetric war, right? Um, on the Chinese side, to some extent on the Russian side, but let's just stay with the Chinese for the time being, the Chinese entities engaged in the resource space are either state-owned enterprises or they are strongly state-supported companies, right? There is almost a case where any significantly sized Chinese company is it running without the tacit or direct involvement and approval of the Chinese government. I mean, that would be, it's almost a technical point. Maybe you can find me one, but I don't know what they would be making. Uh, hairpins, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it would be. They would not be in the resource space. So these are large enterprises, state run. Um, for instance, when you look at the rare earths, right? Um, Chinese have a lot of pricing power there because of their level of production. And therefore, if for strategic reasons, the Chinese government decides to suddenly the price of a specific rare earth uh, goes down and price and, and undercuts Western non-Chinese uh, companies bringing that rare earth resource into development, the Chinese can do that for a long period of time they don't have shareholders they're reporting to. They don't have a quarterly report. They're not watching a stock ticker to see what happens to their shares tomorrow. Um, the uh, overlords they're reporting to uh, are perfectly okay with that and they will help them weather the storm to drive other people out of the market. So it's asymmetrical. On our side, we have hundreds, if not thousands of small, um, they call them in Canada, junior miners developing projects. There is no direct government involvement. They are scuffling for capital and capital markets. Uh, they are working through cumbersome uh, environmental and uh, permitting reviews, per certainly in the United States. That's happening whether they're critical or not critical. So we have a bunch of uh, pipsqueaks, if you will, or irregulars, if you wanna look at the military term, against these highly organized um, state entities on the other side. Um, sounds hopeless, you know. Asymmetric, sounds hopeless. I'm gonna say with proper attention to this as a war, as a tech war, that there are significant ways that we can leverage the strengths we have. I've stated the worst case here because a couple of observations. One, a centrally directed entity of any sort, right, is at high risk. The Chinese may own, own and operate all these resource companies, but they will centralize the decisions. If they make a wrong decision, it will percolate down through, it will damage. There are not a lot of other players trying things in a different way. <clears throat> so an error the Chinese make can echo, <clears throat> pardon, pardon me, can echo down through their um, economic um, environment uh, in a very profound way. We have an advantage insofar as we have all these small companies pioneering, as Pete's talked about, all these different separation techniques, extraction techniques. Um, if they make it big, they make a lot of money. That's the American way. Um, we have a lot of shots on goal, if you will. Now, if the government in the US can, in some respects, signal consistently what's critical and important, and if they can help in some small way, now I'm getting to point three, how can we win this? What can our strategy be? We don't wanna, we don't wanna even up the asymmetrical contest by nationalizing US resources. Let's beat China by being more China-like than China. No, we're gonna lose all the advantages that the US system has in terms of investment flowing to the best uh, potential uh, participants, um, in innovation uh, being unleashed, and all the rewards that come from that. So that's what we wanna preserve. Um, <clears throat> we're good conservatives, right? I'm close to an area where we talk about whether 
this will involve picking winners and losers, government picking winners and losers, and we don't want that, right? We remember DOE, we remember the Obama years, we remember Solyndra, right? So the question would be, can government in the United States support this effort in some way without substituting its wisdom for the wisdom of the markets, right? Um, that would be a bad plan. And I can say, I wanna offer on a theoretical level to folks here, we shouldn't be terrified from attempting to do this. And I will cite Adam Smith, the father of free markets and the wealth of nations itself. And um, where he talks about exceptions potentially to the free market uh, catechism that he's re really otherwise rolling out. He has a section there and I can provide the site afterwards where he says, but when it comes to the provision of gunpowder and sailcloth, perhaps it is not best for Britain to depend on its neighbors as sources of supply. That's a paraphrase. But for gunpowder and sailcloth, for the sailcloth that moves the British Navy around the world and protects the British Empire, and for the gunpowder that is the business end of protecting that empire, best not to depend on neighbors to provide that. When I reread that quote a number of years ago and was involved in this resource world, and I thought of the rare earths because I thought of you guys may like, not like wind power, but our winds, our sailcloth now um, is, is, uh, is potentially powered by rare earths and our gunpowder, our Tomahawk cruise guidance, terminal guidance systems, many other terminal guidance systems, everything that makes a, a dumb bomb, gravity bomb, a smart bomb is powered by rare earths, is made possible by rare earths. So our gunpowder and sailcloth, we currently import from China, right? Adam Smith warned us about that. He said, we may want to make, take steps to make sure that that doesn't happen. I don't want to say Adam Smith is an American firster, right? But he reminded us that there might be national security reasons to make sure that these resources are developed, if at all possible, in the United States. And we know from Pete's talk, it is absolutely possible to meet these requirements uh, if we develop resources and allow them to be developed uh, in the United States. So I want us to be cheered by the fact that we're not picking winners and losers, or we don't have to be worried about picking winners and losers. I would think of it more in this way. Can government institute actions where they don't prescribe how to do something, but they simply signal consistently what they would like to see done, right? Don't tell companies how to extract rare earths. Don't say that the rare earths should come out of the ground, or they should come out of a recycled uh, a smartphone, or they should come out of coal waste pre-combustion, or they should come out of uh, wastewater. Just say that you want the rare earths and let American ingenuity tap into the capital and the um, modes of invention that will allow us to get those materials. At the end of the day, if the Tomahawk cruise missile has American-made permanent magnet, rare earth um, uh, magnets in it, I'm not asking where they came from, where you got that rare earth came, come, came from, as long as it came from the United States, as long as it comes from the United States. Not terribly worried about what um, uh, was the original feedstock for that. And, and as we did as a country in the energy space, fighting back to energy independence, all of the above. Let it be coal, let it be nuclear, let it be renewable, let it be oil, natural gas, all of the above. From this point in the tech war, let the resources come from primary mining, secondary recovery, let them come from unconventional sources like what I've just mentioned, let them come from recycling, all of the above, right? Let's incentive the, incentivize the end product, that is the production in the United States from United States feedstock, separated and refined in the United States using United States processes, and then fabricated into the end products that we need for technological uses, again, if at all possible, in the United States. I'll come back to that list of 35. Of the 35 critical metals and minerals, and we're in such dire straits at the moment, at least 32 of the 35 have known resources in the United States, known resources in the United States. We are, uh, we are geologically blessed in the US. It's on us to figure out how to develop these metals and minerals and bring them into production. We have the means, we have the methods, and we certainly have, I would say now, the mission uh, that we have to get this done.
So that's the lens that I kind of wanted to share with you today. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions on that. And also, uh, again, we're fortunate to have Pete here and uh, Zeke here as well, um, who can amplify uh, different parts of the challenge. Thanks, Dan. That was a really great summary of the, not just the crisis that we have, but the huge opportunities before us. And then when you combine that with what Pete described on how these metals are actually extracted, you can see how a lot of the uh, environmentalists and super regulators want to come in and cripple us and end up benefiting the Chinese and the Congolese warlords and others who are who are extracting these things and then holding us hostage. Uh, right. Now we're going to to so hopefully we'll get into to more of that uh, during Q and A. But now we'll go over to Rabbi Yecheskel Moskowitz who himself is involved in the business of unconventional extraction of rare earths, uh, metals or minerals from things that we already have here, basically what recycling. And he's also come out with an excellent uh, strategy paper, a three-part strategy that we just published today at the Center for Security Policy, looking at the lack of strategy that the United States has, looking at how previous administrations actually helped the Chinese Communist Party to to build this uh, monopoly and near monopoly over these uh, rare earths, metals, and other critical minerals, and uh, and a uh, and three part plan on how we can develop our own sovereignty. So, Rabbi Moskowitz, thank you, Dr. Waller, for this opportunity. Um, so, we heard a lot about. We definitely. We definitely heard a lot of different things about what critical minerals and rare earths are and why they are important and how they are developed. And then we also heard from Dan McGrady, um a full basic scope of, a, I guess you could say, an underlying idea of what rare earths are and what they mean to us and to our national security. But I think um, from my perspective, I, I would like to share with this group, basically, what has been done on a legislative level to actually secure this American interest? So basically what happened was in 2011, the, during the Obama years, there was a, a, a quasi conflict where China was threatening that it was going to halt all exportations of, all exports of critical materials and rare earths. And one of the um, one of the one of the regions that would be most affected with would, would be Japan. The Obama administration at the time did an executive order calling on the U.S. to start its own rare earth programs, and basically giving the Defense Produ Production Act the ability to tap into those sources of funding for the procurement of critical material projects. Unfortunately, they weren't really utilized at the time, to, although they were to some degree, and that's not going to be the topic of today's conversation. But there was a very interesting thing that happened, in my opinion, at that moment, where the president actually delegated his authority, not only to the Department of Defense, but he also delegated his authority to the Department of Interior, to the Secretary of Interior, who would, in consultation with the Department of Defense, with the Secretary of Defense, be able to use the Defense Production Act and its funds to be able to secure critical material funding. This was something that was kind of forgotten and unfortunately China continued in its practices of monopolizing the critical material economy as it stands today. In about, if I remember correctly, in 2017, President Trump was already on a economic warpath with China, rightfully so, started leading an effort to create critical material projects here in the United States. And he, he uh, published an executive order that basically, again, called on the Department of Defense and on the U.S. various, various, um, uh, various offices of his administration to start moving forward with that process. The greatest accomplishment, I guess you can say, of the Trump administration in this regard was that there was a MOU of sorts that was signed with Australia, where Australia was basically going to be replacing the Chinese as our source of critical materials and rare earths, at least for now, until the U.S. was gonna, going to create 
several of its own US-based projects. The Department of Defense took its time and was not able to secure any real funding sources and it actually ended up only just this year, several months ago, it actually put out a, a, a phase one of a series of phases that would have cre would create several projects here in the United States with, I guess you could say, some sort of level of support. But unfortunately, these projects, even if they would come to fruition, would not be achieved until after President Trump's second term. With that, there was an, a letter from the House that was signed on pretty much by the entire Republican leadership urging the Department of Defense and the Department of Interior to act on this. And neither department has really done anything significant in that regard. This was followed by a grant that was given to two different companies. One is Linus, which is an Australian company that will be supposedly opening up a processing facility for heavy rare earths in the United States and Texas. And then you will have another project called um, the Mountain Pass Project, which the current company that is running that project is going, that is going to be receiving this grant as well. Because of the various levels of scrutiny that were, that were submitted because of this, what ended up happening was that these two grants were put on hold. And as of now, there is no actual U.S. strategy that is, to my knowledge, presently available to secure rare earths. With that, we have to do whatever we can, obviously, to secure rare earths and to secure critical minerals for the very simple reason. And Dan touched on this a little bit. When we look at the United States and its position within the greater globe, the way that we secure that position is obviously by re recognizing that the United States is both a military and economic superpower. When you think about econ economics, you think of the dollar as the number one currency in the world. When people want to buy something anywhere, they will accept dollars. They're not going to accept, they're not going to accept shekels and they're not going to accept rent, they're going to accept dollars. And that's because that, that the global economy is based on the dollar. When people think about military might, they think about the United States. These two things will not be able to be sustainable if the United States does not secure its economic interests here in the United States and ensure that our economy is strong and that the American people are taken care of. We see right now in the streets this this civil unrest and the civil unrest is honestly a result of a crippled economy and the obviously which is a result of the COVID-19 pandemic which again comes because China has created all kind of problems for the global for the global community and for our economy and for our national security so with that the most important thing for us to think about is how do we secure U.S. interests and how do we push U.S. interests first, secure our freedom, so that way we could continue being a producer of both economic freedom and also of ideas. Those two things are co combined will ensure that the United States is secure for many years to come. So with that, and this was proposed in my paper that was released to the center today, we have several things that can be done immediately that the United States, through the support of the administration, can actually accomplish rather effectively that would secure those interests. The first that I proposed was that the United States should breathe life back into the Bureau of Mines. And the reason for this is simple. As Pete spoke, the Bureau of Mines was the vehicle that basically kick-started the entire rare earth industry in this country. And that was because it took all the people who were experts in their field on the topics of rare earth develop, uh, project development and procurement and basically gave them the keys to secure those interests for the United States and its national security during the Cold War. And by doing so, we would have the, the 
technical know-how to be able to collaborate the various departments so that we would be able to create projects and secure once again through the USGS the topographic knowledge and data that we would then be able to secure the most economically feasible projects. Right now, the Bureau of Mines is on the books, but it has no budget. Congress can very easily, through one of the one of the various bills that they are going to proposing that are the must-pass bills, such as the ominous bill, or the or the uh, or another COVID bill, to breathe a budget into the Bureau of Mines and give it the capacity to operate. The reason why this is actually important is because that if we are, if we are able to secure a U.S. supply for critical materials and rare earths, that will ensure that manufacturing will remain here in the United States, which a lot of it has come back because the president has done so much to do so. It will continue to do so if we're able to make sure that the, that the, that, that the various materials are available for their manufacturing at a, ver at, a, at a relatively low cost and that they are American made. The second would be that Congress has to do whatever it can to give economic incentives for these pro for people to actually invest money and to do projects. As a, an entrepreneur myself, and as a person who's already involved in several rare earth and critical material projects, I could tell you that the reason why it's difficult to compete with China is because that the Chinese are practically speaking state owned and sponsored by the Chinese. In order to compete with such a reality, we have to be able to give people here the incentive to do so. Now I'm practic I'm right now personally involved in several projects in the United States, one of which has been able to trek along and has garnered a tremendous amount of success through the involvement of the private sector without receiving one US state dollar. But not every single project is such, has such a high, highly economical uh, economic viability that makes it and makes the capex so valuable that there's such a high incentive to get involved in such a project. While this one particular project is very valuable and has a very lucrative makes a very lucrative opportunity based on the geological composition of the project, not every single project is going to be so. In order to compete with the Chinese, we're going to have to provide economic incentives to do so. The president has done something very similar with opportunity zones by giving people these economic and tax incentives to go invest in opportunity zones that will help facilitate better opportunities for certain, certain um, real estate development areas that could use an economic and a, an economic boost. The same kind of ideas can be implemented into the rare earth industry by providing tax incentives that can really incentivize the investors. Th these tax incentives have been actually proposed by um, Senator Cruz in his ORS Act. And I think people should go look at them. It's a very important thing. And third, I think the other issue that and this is, I'll just wrap this up. The other issue is obviously permitting. One of the reasons why the United States is such a difficult area to kickstart once again, the critical material and rare earth industry is because the regulations and permitting structure is rather difficult. In China, when they, rare, when they go and they do a rare earth mine, they don't care if there's acid mine drain, if there's mine acid drainage, and if it basically makes, which practically happens, that makes it a completely, it makes, a certain area uninhabitable and certain villages and towns have been evacuated because the water has become contaminated um, with with no no reprieve whatsoever and the air is so um, smoggy and and unhealthy to breathe because of the various processing facilities that they use that are antiqui antiquated and are not um, as technologically as advanced as, as ours. But we have to believe in American ingenuity and in the American spirit. If we, we have the technology, the United States has the ability to process materials in a much more economical and effective and environmentally safe way than the Chinese do. And with 
healthy amounts of regulations, healthy amounts of, of uh, environmental protection, you could still mine plenty of rare earths and critical materials in the United States in an economically viable fashion. So with that, the president has instructed the FPISC, the F Federal Permitting Count and Steering Council to institute FAST 41 for mining. And I think the president should order the agency to finally put it on the books and to ensure that there is um, streamlined permitting processes for rare earth materials and to put together a regulation and um, environmental protection regimen that makes it financially viable while at the same time protecting the environment and securing a better future for all Americans. Well, thank you for that, Rabbi Moskowitz. This is a this is a good, uh, a great presentation about the whole strategic issue of these minerals. But I'd like to get down to basics for a minute and see if Pete or Dan can address something very simple for our audience. What are rare earths, metals, or minerals, and what do they go into besides, say, magnets for tomahawk missiles? How do they affect us in our daily lives? And also, why are they crucial for our national defense? Pete, Dan, you want me to take that? Take, take it, Pete. Probably, uh, the, historically, the biggest advance in uh, the use of rare earths was the development of the color TV. Uh, that, that, that led to a market for europium, which was one of the pigments that was used in color TV screens. So I, I'd say that's a pretty good example of uh, the use of rare earths uh, in everyday life. Uh, magnets, phosphors, uh, they, oh, the, another good one was uh, rare earths were used in uh, the graphite rods that were uh, used by movie theaters, the arc lights, back when uh, they first started having uh, talkies. And uh, the, the cerium metal that was uh, put into those rods uh, actually uh, came the closest to mimicking the, the uh, natural sunlight. So rare earths are used in uh, lasers today, uh, uh, medical devices, they find their way into, they're, they're pretty much everywhere. I think the uh, uh, American Chemistry Council study about seven or eight years ago found that rare earth chemistry supports 625,000 or so jobs in the U.S. All right, so this is a really substantial part of our economy. Yeah, uh, they're, they're, the <clears throat> the presence of rare earths, um, uh, the Chinese have a rule of thumb, something like a billion dollars of expenditure on rare earths actually enables a trillion dollars worth of economic development. So so it's a huge uh, multiplier there. A um, couple things, and I like that Pete started with the fact that it caused color TVs to happen, which means that uh, Lucille Ball and I Love Lucy, we would not have been able to see her flaming red hair if not for rare earths. That was europium. That was one of the rare earths that made that possible in our color TVs. Single rare earth called europium. Um, couple things that for folks here to just kind of think of how ubiquitous they are. Um, So-called rare earth permanent magnet, with the one variant of which is called an NDFEB. It's got four rare earths in it. It's got neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, and terbium. So four of the 17 rare earths are in the so-called permanent magnet. The vibrate device on our cell phones, which I'm waving here, but you can't see me, um, the vibration device, when you put your phone on vibrate, that is two rare earth um, oscillating magnets with those four rare earths in them causing the vibration. They, uh, that is, uh, at one ton uh, of these magnets, that is what's used in a wind turbine, a single wind turbine, in order to turn the nacelle uh, in the wind turbine. Same for rare earths. The same for rare earths in magnet form, very sophisticated this time, are used in the guidance system of the Tomahawk Cruise. So the Tomahawk Cruise and our smartphone have that commonality for those four rare earths in that magnet form. Also, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. I think it has, it's good news, 
um, right at the moment, near term, it's bad news because we don't have them. But we all want to see the um, United States. We, we don't want to see Huawei and its 5G system um, being used in the US. We don't want to see our friends and allies dependent on Huawei 5G. So let's build our own 5G network. The United States will have the ability to design that network, but phys the physicality of a 5G network, and these things are still physical, even though we, we, they just kind of come to us through the air. The physicality of a 5G network is intense and they need an enormous amount of uh, fiber optics, fiber laser uh, optics, um, one variant of which is called EDFL, um, uh, erbium doped fiber laser. Erbium is one of the heavy rare earths, almost non-existent outside of China. If you don't want to use erbium, you can use tulium. unfortunately, almost non-existent outside of China. You can use eterbium, almost virtually non-existent outside of China. The round top deposit in Texas that I'm on the advisory board we're associated with has those specific heavy rare earths. But if, you not, if the United States is going to build a version of 5G to counter Huawei, unless we're planning on ordering the heavy rare earths out of which we build it from China, we're gonna to have to develop them ourselves. So there's an application on the horizon that we want, and it's going to require an absolutely huge amount of rare earths that heretofore haven't been mined in the United States, and uh, we're going to need um, uh, enormous uh, volumes uh, of them. So um, we are at, I would say, in terms of there's a revolution in material science going on in our world. We're using more and more of the periodic table. We are at the front end of developing applications for which these metals and minerals will be necessary. That's why I keep coming back to the tech war. I want us to focus on the fact that the tech war is defining the world that we live in. Um, the gadgets we have, um, the comforts of home that we have, the way we provide energy, the way we move things around, the way we talk to each other, and the way we wage wars, they're all going to require these metals and minerals. Let me just follow up also, doctor, with one comment on that. I think that like it's also, when people ask me, how does rare earths affect my life? And I think that's one of the things that the Department of Defense, um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to move it, move it over to the Bureau of Mines, because that if we move it into the Department of Interior, which is actually very involved in people's lives on a day-to-day -day life, and we take it away from defense, we're basically going to turn this into a, an issue that affects everybody. One of the reasons why I started up my company material USA for non-conventional recovery because that non-conventional recovery methods are transcend beyond traditional mining and they give an opportunity for almost every single state to be involved and when you have every single state involved in recovery whether it's recovering coal ash or recovering AMD sludge regardless what happens is or or fracking water or sludge and taking rare earths out of that at high pound per million concentrations what ends up happening is that you have m hundreds, if not thousands of more jobs for Americans, not only on the processing side, but on the manufacturing side as well. And that's really important. So it affects you not only because that you need it inside your cell phone, because that you need the rare earths right here. There's, I think, about seven rare, rare earths and critical minerals in my cell phone. You also need it because that the industrial base, a second industrial revolution will come to this country if we secure materials right here in the United States and having a two-pronged strategy by focusing both on traditional methods and non-conventional methods will create an abundance where not only we will be a creator of rare earths and critical materials for our own needs, but we will be an exporter. And if we are an exporter of rare earths, that's how we compete with China on an economic level and break their hold over so many countries, which they currently have, including, by the way, Australia. So what you're saying here is that we we not only can extract these critical minerals from mining, but we can also do it through what's essentially cleaning up existing waste and recycling electronics. Correct. Right. Well, wow. It should, it should be everybody in the country should be supporting this thing then. But 
somehow I don't think they will. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us today at the Center for Security Policy panel, and I urge everybody to take a look at Rabbi Moskowitz's new paper that just came out. It's three-part strategy on how to uh, restore American sovereignty in critical minerals and uh, make us no longer dependent on China. Thank you to all our panelists, Dan McGrody, Pete Rosell, and Rabbi Moskowitz, and to our to our staff also, uh, Adam Savitt and Matthew Franklin, and uh, to all of you. See you thank next you. time. And thank you, Adam. Thank you all.